let's move on instead and let me welcome and introduce Manish Kala, Kala. who uh, is a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist and uh, the lead for the Inherit Arrhythmia Programme at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. So welcome Manish uh, and thank you for joining us. Thanks Rachel, uh, thanks Stephanie. Um, really grateful for the invitation and I'll just share my screen. Do let me know of any technical challenges early on and if there are any then I can fix those. Those slides should be visible now, is that correct? They look great, yeah, thanks. Great, so uh, thanks again Rachel. So my name is Manish, um, I am an electrophysiologist in Birmingham and also involved with our Inherited Cardiac Disease Service. So the objective of uh, my presentation today is to talk about ICD therapy and inherited cardiac disease. Specifically, we'll focus on the challenges of risk stratification in primary prevention, which device to choose and when, complications of device therapy, because that clearly um, impacts upon the discussions we have with our patients, and they will always ask us which one would we choose, which is always the, the difficult question. And then if time allows, there'll be some case examples as well. So I'm sure everybody on this call has seen this diagram from the 2022 guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology for ventricular arrhythmia. And we know that sudden cardiac death is very common. It can often be the first manifestation of cardiac disease, particularly in the inherited cardiac condition service. And these causes are dependent upon age. We know that our younger patients tend to have primary electrical or structural disease. And as one gets older, you acquire other types of disease, such as coronary artery disease. So if we really focus upon the areas where I've got these two boxes, so we've got our molecular channelopathies and we've got our genetic cardiomyopathies. So the mechanisms that lead to ventricular arrhythmia with the molecular channelopathies occur at a cellular level. There's functional changes in ion channels and receptors. And interestingly, when we think about a condition like Brugada syndrome, there is interplay between structural heart disease and cellular pathways as well. If time, I'm sure John will discuss this um, in his presentation. If we think about the genetic cardiomyopathies, there's substrate change, there's hypertrophy, disarray, fibrosis, which is a hallmark of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which also may have elements of microvascular ischemia, Fibro fatty replacement we know is the pathognomonic sign for arrhythmogenic, particularly arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, aneurysms can happen, and also ventricular dilatation as we see in dilated cardiomyopathy. So we're all clear as to the need for the ICD in that it's the most effective treatment for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. They're not the most effective treatment for the prevention of ventricular arrhythmia, and therefore we do need to have a holistic approach to the management of these patients. But central to this is that young patients with inherit, inherited cardiomyopathies with appropriate guideline directed medical therapy and channelopathy patients can have normal life expectancy. But there is this risk of sudden cardiac death. But if you give a patient a cardiac device early in life, there is the long term risk associated with this. And these the three biggest headlines, I think, are inappropriate shocks lead related complications, infections and extraction and therefore accurate patient selection in primary prevention is key. Secondary prevention is clear. A patient has resuscitated, has been resuscitated from a cardiac arrest and then they, we just need to pick the appropriate device for them and we will come to that as we go through the presentation. But it's in the primary prevention group where I think the decisions are substantially harder. So this is a, a little provocative slide that was in um, a paper in the European Heart Journal last year by Corrado saying that the use of risk calculators is increasing. So perhaps we're aiming, we're heading towards an area where clinician, so this little icon here, has a certain passive element of decision making, which I thought was provocative, a dependence upon a risk calculator, for example, the ARVC risk calculator or the 123 calculator for long QT. And that leads to a higher rate of device implantation. We have an alternative approach which is where you have your clinician who is able to utilize the risk calculator, but also works within an MDT, has expertise, 
and is able to use other therapeutic options to move away from defibrillator therapy, such as adequate use of appropriate beta blockade in long QT syndrome, when should you use sympathetic denervation, other antiarrhythmic medications such as quinidine, or in our experience, for example, sotolol and mexilatine and ARVC. And then you have this model, which is you have an experienced clinician who has lots and lots of experience and makes the right decision for that patient. So it'd be interesting to see what the chairs and the members of um, the audience think about this sort of paradigm that the Corrado and colleagues decided to discuss. But this was a useful graph in their risk stratification armory that they also presented that the high risk category for the commonest conditions we see, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, long QT and Brugada syndrome, this is pretty clear. And making decisions in this category doesn't require too much thought. The low risk category again is quite clear and in the interest of time we won't go through this box. And the difficulty really comes in how we utilise the existing data sets, registry data, calculators and the MDT in making a discussion and making a decision in this group. So I'll leave that in there that you'll be able to look in the recording and I've got the referral, sorry, the reference down at the bottom. Let's focus on the ICD. So we've decided that our patient meets the criteria for a primary or secondary prevention device. How are we going to make our choice? So we have two options. We've got a transvenous system. So this has been around the longest. It's stood the test of time. And then probably over the last 15 years or so, we've seen an emergence of the SICD system. So this is specifically focused on the Boston Scientific SICD system, which is called Emblem, although there is an emerging one from Medtronic, which I've not focused on this one today, but perhaps we can discuss it in the question section. So we can see that the first generation SICD was quite big and it was quite fat. And then this is compared to a single chamber ICD. As you add more leads, the header component tends to get bigger, but the actual battery casing tends to stay the same size. And we can see that the new device from the SICD standpoint is thinner and slightly taller. So let's think about the transvenous ICD first. So clearly there are some leads inside the heart, so we get pacing function, and it allows us to deliver ATP, so anti-tachycardia pacing. For example, if a patient has a monomorphic VT, then it can be terminated painlessly. It's a smaller pulse generator, as you can see here. The battery life now tends to be in excess of 10 years, a shorter charge time and therefore faster shock delivery. You can also use it for patients with conduction system disease and cardiomyopathy, so you can deliver cardiac resynchronization therapy or biventricular pacing. Screening is not needed and we've got long term data. But clearly there was a problem with this device and that's it's, it's intravascular and any intravascular device has stresses and strains on the leads. You can get lead dysfunction, lead infection, lead fracture. Therefore, the SICD was also developed. So you don't need vascular access. It's possible to implant without x-ray. They think there's a reduced midterm risk of lead malfunction because we don't have long term data yet. You're not going to get a pneumothorax or tamponade. There is arrhythmia discrimination and whether it's improved or not, we can discuss. Extraction is much easier. And then hardware infections tend not to cause bacteremia. And then bacteremia can lead to device related endocarditis. It can be just associated with a lead in transvenous systems, but can be then progressed to involving valves and therefore embolization and lots of other problems. So practically, this is what a transvenous system looks like. So in a slim patient, you'll see in a pre-pectoral pocket, which is what we normally use, it's quite prominent. You can see the incision there, and this is a single chamber device, and you'll see a single coil on this lead. The SICD can be hidden quite nicely underneath the latissimus dorsi, and you can see here, so particularly for younger people, they may not want a large generator on the front of their chest, and therefore this can be hidden underneath, for example, where the bra strap would be, or you use the latissimus dorsi muscles, so it can be quite well hidden, and this is what it looks like on a chest x-ray, and this is part which is tunneled just into the left parasternal position. So these are complications of device implantation but I'll skip over this slide in the interest of time because we have gone through this when we were talking about the differences in the device. 
let's look at registry data. So just in the realm of primary prevention, what can we learn? So this is quite an old paper. It's from 2013, but it's from a very experienced group. We have to keep in mind that the decisions made for primary prevention were different and also implant techniques have modified since then as well. But we can see in a single center, a large number of patients and the vast majority towards the end of this period. And the commonest indications were Brigada syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and long QT. And in Brigada syndrome, 79% of implants were after EP study. And this is also a controversial area. Some groups do it, some groups don't do it. And actually how much it refines risk stratification remains a subject of quite a lot of debate. But nevertheless, uh, predominantly in research centres and when we were learning more about Brigada syndrome, particularly late 90s, early 2000s, there was more electrical, uh, electrophysiological testing done. And you can see that's reflected in the number of primary prevention implants that have gone in in Brigada syndrome. But specifically, let's look at the therapies. So this is quite a complex figure, but let's look at the headlines. So in Brigada syndrome, the median follow up was 62 months, so pretty good. And there were no shocks in the primary prevention group. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, half were primary prevention indications. And most of these patients had two or more risk factors. And this was associated with a twofold increased risk of appropriate shocks. And we can see that in primary prevention, there were 4.2 shocks per 100 patient years, which is reasonably high, but quite and similar to the secondary prevention group. So even then, at that stage, with a less mature risk calculator, people were doing a pretty decent job of predicting risk in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Long QT once again. So this is where actually adequate medical management and experience with therapy options such as pacing or cardiac denervation can allow primary prevention to be reduced to 1.5 shocks per 100 patient years. And in ARVC, as expected, 70% was secondary prevention. Interestingly, in their experience, Sotalol use did not reduce shocks. And we can see in the secondary prevention group, shocks were quite high. But again, in the primary prevention group, we can see that they're in the same sort of ballpark as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Complications are also higher. So if you look in this group's publication, there were 27% device related complications. And if we look here in the primary prevention group and we look at harm, we can see that in Brigada syndrome, where you didn't have any shocks, we can also see in idiopathic familial VF, in ARVC, you were certainly balanced, and in the long QT group and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy group, they had larger numbers and therefore we may see more complications. Quite a lot of the complications were acute, so within 30 days, and these are things such as lead dislodgement, so we can see here 15%. Lead fracture was quite common, which I found quite interesting. If you look here, 23% during the follow-up period, but overall, 35% in long-term follow-up experienced a device-related complication, be it acute or be it long-term. And if we can see here, device-related endocarditis, 11%. So that will be substantial morbidity and extraction is associated with significant mortality. So how about the SICD? Because I've shown you that the transvenous ICD, while being a good device, it stood the test of time, is associated with predominantly lead associated complications. So this is a paper which compared the SICD in structural heart disease and also channelopathy, and I've shown the channelopathy breakdown here, against a meta-analysis of transvenous ICDs. There are 199 patients in the channelopathy group, and a substantially larger number in the structural heart disease group, which also included coronary disease and cardiomyopathy. And we can see here that the patients were younger in the channelopathy group. Appropriate therapies, 9.5% in channelopathy, higher in structural heart disease, as you'd expect, because there's probably scar substrate. But again, complications, particularly when we're looking at young patients, we need to consider. So inappropriate shocks, 8.5%. In the channelopathy group, structural heart disease, 12.5%. Now, programming has evolved with the SICD in that with now dual zone programming, where you can have a conditional zone where an arrhythmia is monitored, but it's more likely to be sinus tachycardia, our young patients exercise, you're not committed to a shock. Whereas in the VF zone, the device is committed to a shock. Complications are lower than the last set of data that I've shown you. So two to 4% infection, erosion 1.5%, technical complications with the lead or generator in 1.5%. If we compare these complications to our most recent 
audit of our device uh, practice at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. So in nearly 600 devices, our 30 day complication rate was kind of in this ballpark overall. We're looking at around a two to 5% complication rate depending upon operator. So you can see that actually transvenous practice has evolved over time as well. And we can see here that inappropriate shocks were 8.5% in the channelopathy group, high in the non-channelopathy group, but when we went to dual zone programming, this could be minimized. There's also less device complications for the SICD. I'm conscious of time. I've got some clinical cases to review, so I'll skip over this slide. But essentially, this was showing that there were less device associated complications with the SICD compared to the transvenous ICD. So how will we guide our patients having gone through this? So we've talked about risk stratification. So that's making the decision as to whether we're going to offer a device or not. Then we've talked to them about what devices are available. And then we are going to have to make a clinical indication. So a transvenous system is absolutely indicated when there is a pacing indication or there's indication for cardiac resynchronization. So reduced ejection fraction and conduction system disease, specifically left bundle branch block. Inadequate transcutaneous signals, and I'll show you a clinical example of that. This is all comes down to screening effectively. The middle zone is if someone's had a monomorphic VT that is more likely to be responsive to ATP, then they're going to do better with a transvenous system. And also the probability of developing an indication to pacing. And I'll show you a case example of this. However, there's quite a large group that we can really look at the SICD to minimize morbidity for our patients. And even if the indication changes, one can always then switch to a transvenous system later in life. But if you can protect someone for a decade or two decades without an intravascular system, that's a good thing. So, for example, primary prevention of structural, sorry, sudden cardiac death. Young patients, channelopathy patients, where you're not likely to need a pacing indication, although in long QT that needs to be considered very carefully. Obviously, idiopathic VF, non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, high risk of infection. For example, we have patients who've had previous transvenous system extraction once or twice, and then you're really only left with the op option of an SICD. Patients with dialysis, when you need to consider an SICD, uh, an ICD and SICD tends to work better, the lack of vascular access, and also prior complications to transvenous leads. What about sport? So again, I focused on our younger patients. So this is data from an American group which looked at 372 athletes. The age range was quite big, actually. It was between 10 and, and 60, but most were participating in regular sports. There was a relatively small number of people participating in high-risk sports, which they defined things such as skiing, there were no arrhythmic deaths or cardiac arrests or shock related injury, so patients can exercise. There was an increase in therapy with sport, and you can see this will be driven predominantly by patients with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we do know that there is data, particularly from the Hopkins group, that there is an increased risk of substrate progression in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy specifically with exercise. But nevertheless, this will be an individualized discussion that we will have with our patients, but sports can be done. I think the intensity needs to be moderated. It needs a lot of counseling and education. And we all know of famous professional sports persons, particularly playing football now with defibrillators, and they tend to be SICDs. So if there's time, uh, Rachel and Stephanie, I've got a handful of clinical cases, if that's okay. No, it'd be, it'd be lovely to hear, uh, to hear those, that we've got plenty of time, so thank you. OK, great. Thanks, Rachel. So let's think about our first case. So we have an 18 year old male. He was known to have long QT syndrome with a homozygous mutation in KCNQ1. He's on propranolol, sustained release, 80 milligrams twice daily, and he's fully compliant with therapy. He's got bilateral sensory neural deafness. He's had some mental health issues with depression and he has symptomatic bradycardia. And I'll show you his ECG. So this is his ECG in outpatients. So I think you'll agree that he's very bradycardic. His PR interval is normal. His QRS duration is normal. He's got that typically broad based T wave that you'll see in long QT1. And you'll see here without the need of any sort of fancy calculations that his absolute QT interval in lead two is nearly coming up 
to 600 milliseconds. And you'll see here from just the calculator, which would have used the Bazet equation, so it would not have been entirely accurate at this heart rate, his corrected QT is over 500 milliseconds. And this is on an adequate dose of propranolol. So he's clearly high risk in that he's got a homozygous mutation. He's high risk in that he's a young male. Despite beta blockade, he's got a very long absolute QT. And we discussed his case and actually discussed with colleagues at George's as well. And we opted to give him a dual chamber ICD. And our view was that he has a homozygous mutation. He's a young male and that tends to subtend a higher risk. He has a very long QT interval despite beta blockade. And you'll see with atrial pacing at a much higher rate. So we can see here he's pacing at around 70 beats per minute. His QT shortened to less than 500 milliseconds. And we saw him recently and his QT interval on the same medications with pacing is now running at about 460 to 470 milliseconds. So that's encouraging for him. One could have considered sympathetic denervation and we discussed this. We don't have a big program for that at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and that's something we're building upon. But maybe in our discussion, we can see what should have come first in terms of mitigating his arrhythmic risk. But what made it easier in this setting was that he was compliant with medical therapy, but he had symptomatic bradycardia with fatigue and therefore that made our decision a little bit easier, but obviously happy to discuss. So. Case number two, so 36 year old female, uh, she has a family history of heart failure. So her mother died of decompensated heart failure. Her maternal aunt has had a heart transplant and her genetic testing was positive for the lamin A mutation. She's had one episode of atrial fibrillation requiring hospital admission. And in 2020, she had a completely normal cardiac MRI with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 58%. This was her ECG in 2020, so we can work through this together. So reasonably good ventricular rate. She's in sinus rhythm. Her PR interval is normal, 187 milliseconds, and her QRS duration is normal and no other significant repolarization abnormalities. So she remained under follow up because of the AFib episode. We gave her an implantable loop recorder. She'd had some presyncope, but the device didn't really pick anything up that was suggestive of an arrhythmia. Then she was seen in the clinic in 2022 and then you can see now she's developed prolongation of her PR interval. So it's subtle and she's also got some PACs, which is in keeping with her history of atrial fibrillation. We can see a slightly longer PR interval here on the rhythm strip. All the other parameters remain the same. So I decided to get another MRI and then now she's got a new mid myocardial scar in the interlateral wall. We can see this here. There's also some gadolinium uptake in the septum. And what I found a little bit more worrying is that there was dilatation of the left ventricle and reduction in her ejection fraction since an older MRI in 2018. And her ejection fraction had dropped from the high 50s to the lower 50s. So this required quite a lot of discussion on our part, but we opted to go for a CRTD implant. And you can see this is her chest X-ray here. And this is an example that I said initially about the emergence of risk calculators. And you know, these are relatively rare conditions. There's not a lot of numbers in these calculators, but you can see specifically for her case, she's female, she has a non-missense mutation, she does have first degree heart block, she's not had VT. I put her ejection fraction in, and we can see here that her risk of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia in five years is 15%. So that's quite high. And if we look at the guidance, we can see here that we follow this through. She's had genetic testing. She's got a pathogenic mutation in lamin A. Her five-year risk is greater than 10%. Her ejection fraction is going down and she has conduction delay. So this was kind of where one has to make an individualized decision. So the MDT thought given her age, should we then just wait for a further reduction in her ejection fraction, but she's got new scar and she's got quite a malignant family history. So we decided to protect her with the device. So moving on to SICDs. So this is a 26 year old male. He's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, so young patient, he's non-obstructive. So we're not thinking about pacing. He's NYHA1, no family history, abnormal response to exercise. He's had a blackout. He's had a muscular BSD closed as a child, so you have some additional myocardial scarring. And his risk score was 6.73%, and his BMI was 34. We can see here that in the secondary 
configuration, so the secondary vector, so this is part of screening, where there's a primary, secondary, and alternative vector, we can see here that it's defined something called an untreated episode. And we can see here that actually it was probably exercising. This looks like sinus rhythm to me. It looks like sinus tachycardia, but clearly some noise comes in on this channel, which has then confused the device. And then we can look here that when we did screening in this gentleman, so we can see here this is standing and this is exercise, that during the secondary configuration, it actually did fail. So the alternate failed in recovery and upon standing, but this gentleman was programmed to the secondary configuration. And you'll see here that this is where the device failed. And this is him, his ECGs when he's standing. So you can see the typical reprisation abnormalities in the T wave of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But the R wave is pretty big compared to the amplitude of the T wave. So you can see how that would have passed in at rest. And then you can see as he exercises, the R wave comes down, the T wave goes up, and therefore he's at much higher risk of inappropriate therapies. And you can see here that the secondary vector failed, but the primary is fine. So he just needs appropriate programming. The reason I put this in is that there is an importance to undertaking detailed screening, not only at rest, but with exercise, particularly in young patients with SICD. And so after exercise, we were then able to program him to primary, increase the gain, check the position, and then we exercised him again. And you can see here the ratio between the R wave and the T wave is maintained. One of the other things to have caution with SICDs is with patients with high body mass index. So this is again a young male patient with a mixed phenotype cardiomyopathy, poor rejection fraction, class two, elements of an aortopathy, he has sleep apnea and morbid obesity. So this is his baseline screening and you can see, look, he's done reasonably well, no problems at all. So he got an SICD as one would favour in a young patient. Then he presents to a and &E a year later with a shock just from turning around in bed. And you can see here that his shock impedance was really high. You can see here that the signal quality is nowhere near as accurate as it was at baseline. And here he's been given a shock. And then after, obviously he's woken up and he's changed position, the vector has changed and it's got a bigger amplitude. So we recreated this, so we turned him from supine to the left-hand side, so you can see shock therapies are off. This is gain setting them one times, primary configuration, and you can see here as he turns over, he loses R wave, pretty much becomes equivalent to T wave, and you can see how this could be an absolute sitting duck for an inappropriate shock once again. So we took, undertook some detailed testing. So we can see here with primary configuration, double gain, not really going to work with, because of T wave over sensing. Secondary configuration, similarly, we can see a drop in amplitude on movement. Secondary configuration with more gain, again, T wave over sensing. And with the alternate, where he didn't perform well in the first instance anyway, and it failed, and you can see it's not going to be discriminatory. So this, in this patient, we had to explant and replace it with a transvenous system. So in summary, ICDs save lives, but other arrhythmia reduction strategies do need to be explored fully, and that's where you need expertise within your MDT or liaise with colleagues across the country who are part of the AICC um, community. Shared decision making is key. ICD implant rates are increasing worldwide and speculatively it may be driven by registry data leading to some calculators. We do need to understand the limitations of these and furthermore longer term data will continue to inform our practice. Thanks once again for the invitation. Happy to take any questions if time allows. Thanks Manish, that was a, a great talk and I love the, the clinical cases, so thank you.